Minister of Defence in the Cabinet by the Interim Iraq Governing Council from September 2003 till 2004. He did his MBA from Harvard Business School and also stayed as a professor at the Oxford University. Uh, in January 2007, Dr. Alawi published an article outlining a blueprint for peace in Iraq. Uh, the article was praised by commentator Patrick Cockburn, who would argue that it was by far the most perceptive analysis of the extent of the disaster in his country and how it might best be resolved. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Alawi with salawat. Also, um, for children under the age of 12, there is a children's program in the library as well. Thank you. And on the occasion of this uh, new uh, Hijri year, uh, I wish all the gathering here the best of times and the widest of openings, inshallah, as we uh, approach uh, the first uh, 10 days of this month. May Allah, inshallah, grant you uh, access to the uh, uh, to the Lataif, inshallah. Uh, I've entitled my my talk uh, "Reflections on the Rising of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam." And it, it will be more uh, less of a lecture and more of a series of. Uh, uh, flashes about the uh, events uh, of Karbala and why they have had such a enormous uh, and wide-ranging impact over the centuries. And it is, of course, we see the events of Karbala through the prism of time, the time of uh, 2010 is not the same as the time of uh, 61 uh, Hijri when the uh, uh, tragedy took place. And between today and between those uh, uh, events of 14 hundred years ago, the interaction and engagement of people especially of the uh, Mormons, of the uh, Shias of al Bayt, and of Muslims in general, have uh, changed. And each epoch, each stage in time has its own understanding and interpretation as to the significance of these events, both on the individual concerned, on society, and on humanity at large, and across religions, across the sects within Islam, and between the religions, where the event also resonates with those who are not necessarily uh, Muslims, but they understand the subtler meanings, the significance of the event. So the first reflection or flash that I would like to share with you is that the events of Karbala are really singular. They, and it's not the nature or intensity of the tragedy. Uh, these are not really, uh, there have been other cases and other incidents uh, of greater or lesser uh, outer uh, tragic sequence of events. 
but it is singular because there has been no preparation for it. All the great events that seem to have the same characteristics or features of Karbala have a certain prehistory to them. Uh, great defeats or victories in war. Uh, great events like the killings of, of uh, leaders or human beings, of, or of leading human beings, those who've had a significant impact on the history of their times and on their societies. There's always a series of events that happens before that. There's a s series of events that sort of culminate in the, in the act or the circumstance. But in the case of the events of Karbala, everything is sandwiched in a few weeks. In a few weeks, the entire spectrum of uh, human uh, affairs, as it were, is compressed in these few weeks. And there is little preparatory uh, work preceding it. If you look at, for example, the, the uh, rule of uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam, uh, in Kufa, before, his, before his, his death, before his assassination and murder, there was a series of events. There was the events of the uh, assassination of the Khalifa Uthman, followed by the bay'ah of Imam Ali alayhi salam, followed by the various battles that he had to face, followed by Nahrawan, followed by the Khawarij, which led, culminated in sort of sequential order in his, in his death. If you look at uh, the uh, Prophet وسلم, and his entry into Mecca, the culmination of the temporal journey of the Prophet was preceded by two decades nearly of interaction and engagement. And the, there was a buildup, a sequence in time. But in the case of Karbala, the, the event was worked out, was played out in really just a few weeks. And the, it is the whole history of mankind, as it were, was squeezed into these, into these few weeks. Not in terms of specific events or deeds, but more in terms of the underlying meanings and actions and perceptions of people. Nearly every aspect of human affairs was put into those few weeks. And the significance, the singularity of the event is that the entire range of human history was acted out. You have the juxtaposition of fundamental vices and virtues that compose good and evil. And these that lie behind the entire spectrum of human actions they're at the heart of the Karbala tragedy. Nearly every virtue or its negation, every vice, is exhibited in Karbala. Nearly every uh, fundamental aspect, characteristic of human behavior is squeezed into that. So if, you, if an outsider looks at the range of human history and just focuses on these two or three weeks, they are actually between middle of June until the 1st of October of uh, uh, the uh, 60, 61st year of the Hijra that these events took place. The entire spectrum of uh, human emotions and the consequences of these, of these actions are compressed. So Karbala from that point of view is singular and it, there are, it has no other parallels to it in any aspect, I believe, in human history. There are, of course, as I said before, heroic and uh, desperate and decisive encounters. Uh, I can think of many. I'm sure you can too. I mean, the Battle of Thermopylae, for example, when uh, 300 uh, Greeks, Spartans, uh, faced off a huge uh, Persian army. You can say that it's a, it's a decisive event, and if the tide of battle went against the Greeks, the entire uh, unfolding of the drama that is Western civilization would have taken a different, a different uh, form. But that, this is an aspect where only a few features of the range and spectrum of human emotions uh, were exhibited. If, if I go back to the Battle of Thermopylae, you're talking about 
uh, the, defined mainly by the physical courage of the defenders against an overwhelming enemy. So courage and a desperate struggle was the theme of that battle, which had huge consequences in terms of history. But in Karbala, you had not only courage versus, versus cowardice. You had every other potential range of human emotions exhibited in these, in these uh, uh, few weeks. So the entire gamut of motivations and drives that underlie human actions and that are the stuff of history within a larger framework that encompasses the virtues and vices, that is, in my mind, one of the singular features of the Karbala uh, uh, event. And it is un the universality of this event, of the Karbala paradigm, as it were, because it illuminates the principle of uh, Tawheed more than any other event, I believe, in human, in human history. And if you are looking at the meaning and the underlying uh, basis and foundations of the deen of Islam, which is Tawheed, it is expressed in the events in Karbala culminating in the 10th uh, of Muharram. You have action versus inaction. The action of the few versus the inaction of the many. You have the issue of what is legitimate and what is illegitimate in power and authority. You have the issue of justice versus oppression, fear versus hope, the fear of the people of Kufa that, that they will be cowed into submission by uh, the terror that was imposed on them by Ibn Ziyad against the hope and the raja of the people who were with, with the Imam salam. You have loyalty and betrayal. These are fundamental elements of the human drama, of the human condition both in their inner and outer aspects that are uh, uh, crystallized in Karbala. The, the, the secondary aspects are also there, and it is unfortunately, and I say, I say that guardedly, but uh, with some conviction, it is a secondary characteristics of Karbala that uh, forms the basis now of what we understand to be the model of Karbala. We see it in terms of courage and cowardice, we see it in terms of grief and exaltation. We see it in terms of a huge offense committed against the Ahlul Bayt and the, uh, the rightful vengeance that is due them. We see it in the form of rebellion and tyranny. But I call these, uh, these are in reality secondary characteristics of this greater ethical uh, frontier, the greater issue of good and evil, the greater issue of action and inaction, the greater issue of legitimacy and illegitimacy. And because the secondary characteristics have been allowed, as it were, to define the, the model of Karbala, most of us see it in terms of how it, it unfolds in theological, in political, in social, and even in revolutionary terms. People tend to see uh, Karbala as an example of uh, the Imam alayhi salam acting in, in the form of a rebel or revolutionary demanding change, or in the form of, of uh, the Imam salam acting out a kind of uh, model as to how uh, an Imam of the Ahlul Bayt ought to or should, should behave. But these are all explained or wrapped up in understanding it in terms of time and space. So I call that the horizontal understanding of Karbala. And it is not in itself uh, 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 deficient, but it does not tell the entire story. It, ha it is consistent in its own terms. There's nothing wrong with, with trying to relate to the, to the imam in terms of uh, action to overturn wrong, or in terms of action that would lead to uh, an improvement in, in the social life of Muslims, or in terms of action in order to uh, put a regime or a rule of justice on earth. There's really nothing wrong with that. But what has been missing from my reading of the events and from my engagement with it is how does that relate to the issue of Tawheed? How does that relate to what I would call the vertical axis where the events of Karbala become more significant than 
they're unfolding in time and space. And above all, how does Karbala allow us, as it were, to engage with those archetypes or the unseen? Without that element of it, without that vertical element, any description or any engagement with it becomes, I think, uh, incomplete and ultimately uh, can be turned against its very, uh, uh, very purposes. I'll give you an example of, of what, what I'm saying. Most of us see Karbala in terms of, of the end result being one of, of uh, slaughter, death, enslavement under the most horrible circumstances. And the rituals that allow us to remember this are to do with, with uh, pathos, grief, sorrow, self-mortification. These, these are all symbols and rituals that allow us to engage with the uh, apparent end result of the events of Karbala, which is death and enslavement. So the finality of the event is to do with the issue of, of death. And it becomes defined in the form of sacrifice, martyrdom, and, and such, such, uh, such epithets. And I think this is really does the events a great, a great injustice because it reduces the Imam Islam to a heroic figure and only a heroic figure. And a heroic figure on top of that who, who is molded in the, tragic, in the tragic mold. So we relate to the Imam in terms of his self-sacrifice, in terms of his courage. And in some ways, I think you, you put the figure of the Imam Hussein on par, as it were, with other self-sacrificing, courageous uh, heroes. Of course, the Imam is, is not just a self-sacrificing, courageous hero. There's another aspect to his being that is the aspect that makes the imam due to him. He is not an imam because he is courageous or because he is self-sacrificing or because he's a martyr. He's an imam because the position of imam itself needs a person like Imam Hussein in order to complete the two. So death is is only the end result of the Karbala paradigm, if you, if you want to call it that, if we contrast death to life. But death is not the opposite of, of life. Death is the opposite of birth. Life has, a, has a, another extension beyond the physical realm. And if we do not relate the, sac the outer sacrifice and the outer courage of the Imam to the ongoing life which is embedded in the Imam, eh? then I think we are seeing, we are seeing uh, the events from only one, one angle. We are from only one, one eye, and the other eye is shut. And to get a complete picture, both eyes have to be open at the same time. The eye that looks at it in terms of space and time, which is what we have been uh, taught and what we have been engaged with over, over the centuries. And the eye that looks at it in terms of what does it mean in Tawheed? What does it mean in terms of Tawheed? Because if we believe that, that, that death is merely the departure, as it were, of the soul or the, the wali over the self to another realm, and it is merely moving from one station to the next, then you can't reduce the events of Karbala to simply the loss of what appears to be uh, temporal life. In many ways, therefore, the, the, uh, the end of Karbala, the end result, is only a station to something else. And I think it is incumbent upon us to understand the pathways to this other, uh, to this other uh, way of understanding. And we must assume that the Imam Hussain Imam Hussein knows, knew this. He did not see it in terms of the way we see it, of a self-sacrificing martyr courageously going to his death. Because to him, the finality of death is not in this, expressed in this way. It has this other dimension, which it is necessary for us, if we cannot experience it, to at least explore it, to get some idea that the Imam was not only Imam of the outer realm, of the physical world, 
of the realm of substance and matter, or the realm of the rusum, as a great master in Habib calls it, but he is also the imam of the non-sentient world, of the world which is not subject to the laws of cause and effect. And that world, if we are able to access it through the events of Karbala and see it with both eyes, then I think the reality of Karbala becomes, becomes uh, far more real. Now, I go back to the various, various uh, uh, as it were, elements that define the, the function of, uh, of the imam in both in the outer world as well as in the sort of the meta world, the world of the cosmos. Many of us think that imama is in some ways connected with, with, with khilafah, so that both the spiritual aspects of the imam and the temporal aspects of the imam are united with possibly the latter, that is the temporal, the, the issue of power uh, prevailing. But Imam, as I understand it, goes beyond the, the, the individual definition of it, the way that, that, that I have described it. That is, it is a station where the holder of that office is, precedes all else in the physical world. But it is more of a general, a general station, a station that is, has both a dimension in time and a station that has a dimension outside of time. And it is a station that, that by definition requires the, the, the holder of that office or that position to be obeyed and it is obligatory to follow and obey his word. Now that word may not be expressed in the form of physical control and power over the individual, but it is a station that if we recognize and accept, then it is one where it is obligatory for us to assume and to accept the commands as being uh, final and definitive. So it is a world in many ways that stands, the world of the imam stands on its own, one that is apart from the way we understand it in terms of power, in terms of time. And it has its own rules and symbols. So whether the imam actually exercises physical power or exercises control or exercises authority in the outer form. He may not do that. Most of the imams of the Ahl Bayt didn't, were not involved in any way in the exercise of power, were not involved in any way in direct rule over the others. But that does not reduce one iota the demand on those who claim allegiance to them to accept their total authority over you because of the station of the, of the imam. So the, the imam of, of, uh, of Imam Hussain alayhi salam started the, the minute or the second that, that the, 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 the life of uh, Imam Hassan alayhi salam moved from the physical to the uh, non-physical realm. And for a long time, and we have to ask ourselves, if you look at the imam only in terms of space and time, what happened between the, d the day that Muawiyah died and the, uh, sorry, the day that, that, that Imam Hassan alayhi salam died and the day that Muawiyah died. There was nearly 11 years. For 11 years, Imam Hassan alayhi salam did not challenge the authority and the rule of Muawiyah in the outer form. Of course, many people explain that by saying that there was a treaty between Imam Hassan alayhi salam and Muawiyah, and part of the treaty included uh, the, uh, the statement or the condition that upon the, the death of Muawiyah, the, the ummah, the community as a whole, would select his successor rather than uh, Yazid, uh, who was, of course, was being uh, plotted to succeed Muawiyah as soon as Imam Hassan alayhi salam died. The fact that Imam Hussein did not challenge Muawiyah over the 11 years in which the last years of Muawiyah coincided with the Imam of Imam Hussein is to me very, very clear evidence that Imam Hussein did not see his Imam in terms of 
the balance of political power, which allowed him to rise when Muawiyah died. If anything, the balance of political power was easier in the days of Muawiyah than it was when Yazid uh, uh, came, to, came to power. So the, the, the attempt to understand the Imam Hussain and the events of Karbala only in terms of their outer reality in, inverts, in my mind, the principle of the Imam, which is to do with the way I have described it. It is to do with a station that extends in and beyond time. And those who claim allegiance to the Imam and to the station of the Imam cannot only relate it to the exercise of political power in temporal uh, terms. And I think the same rules apply to the meaning of the wali and to the meaning of the shahid or shaheed. That once you reduce them to the physical and to the temporal, once they're reduced to space and time, and the other aspects of it are gone, then the notion of the imam is shrunk to a level that we understand it, rather than we trying to expand our knowledge of the imam to the point where we will never be able to understand it completely, but at least to understand the underlying principles behind the access to the unseen with which the imam acts as the bridge. So here I'd like to make a statement which I would call an axiom or a law, for those of you who studied engineering or physics. And that is no meaning can be attributed to the outer aspects of events without recognition of their inner realities especially those of us who claim allegiance to the Imams of the Ahl Bayt The truth that we all seek connects the inner and the outer and transcends them both. And the pathway to, this, to these, these types of realities must be the example of the Imams. So when we talk about wilaya, what do we, what do we actually mean in that context? We mean an allegiance to and the guidance of and the return of the wali to the wali, who in absolute terms is Allah, of course. And it is also a, a term that connects the two, it connects the inner and outer life. So Imam Hussein's wilaya and his imama and his shahada have an, inver an inverted and opposite uh, meaning to what we commonly understand to be their significance. So tragedy, the tragedy of Karbala becomes the victory of Karbala. Death is transcended into everlastingness. Grief is merely the absence of bliss as they move from one condition to the next. So as we see the Imam in this, in this, in this reality, the, the outer reality shrinks, diminishes, and dies to be replaced by and expanded by and transcended by the inner reality which, has no, which sees no limitations. So the symbols of Karbala and its metaphors of martyrdom fighting against evil and injustice, even Imam Hussain as a social and political revolutionary are seriously deficient in understanding the significance of the event as a gateway to the unseen. So for the last, since the days of, uh, of 61 uh, Hijri until now, people have tried to fix the events of Karbala in, in sort of historical terms and stripping it from this aspect of Tawheed. And that is because it's all filtered through the, the physical and material, the prism of social, political, cultural, and religious structures. In fact, anything that is to do with, with the outer forms of power and authority. So even though we may think of Karbala as synonymous with sacrifice, selflessness, resistance to oppression and injustice. By just limiting it to this, we are limiting it to its spatial and to its temporal dimensions. So the Imam as a martyr, the innocence killed, the hopelessness of the struggle, these are all made to be the basis of a theology of lament rather than a theology of success. And it becomes, in many ways, those who subscribe to this understanding of Karbala, it becomes like a, a, you know, a passport to being the elect and uh, th those 
who, who have certain privileged access uh, to the truth. And we then begin to see Muslims and Islam as being somehow redeemed by the sacrifice of the few in Karbala. And I think in many ways this is uh, not only diminishes the, the inner significance and the transcendental significance of Karbala, but it also takes, puts us into realms that are somewhat outside of the uh, Tawhidi framework of Islam. So the horizontal that we all know and we all celebrate must be connected to the vertical, must be connected to the, to the axis that takes you to a kind of beyond history, a kind of metaphysic beyond the physical realm. And I think this is, I'm not saying that out of, out of my whims or out of my uh, uh, predilection to uh, the inner dimensions of Islam or because I, I've read too much of an Arabi. This is what the Imam himself alludes to in his discourses and letters. In the few weeks when he enters history in temporal terms, before that, before the days, before the events of Karbala, from the death of Imam Hassan alayhi salam until the departure of the Imam from Mecca, there is very, very little that has been said about or by the Imam. So he also compresses, as it were, his, his uh, unfolding in time and space in these few weeks. So the, 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 the discourses, the letters, the statements that he makes in these few weeks are signals and very important signals to our understanding of what, what are the functions of an imam when confronted with the realities of uh, the outer world. So the imam alayhi salam uh, and here uh, I'm relying mainly on uh, Abu Mukhnaf and Tabari. Of course, you know, Tabari drew, uh, Abu Mukhnaf drew a bit from Tabari. But uh, there, there are, there are uh, the attributions are, are quite well substantiated and the, and the isnad is real. So the statements and the uh, 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 exclamations and discourses of the Imam in that in those few weeks, uh, whatever it was, nine weeks, between his departure from Mecca and his, uh, his uh, martyrdom uh, uh, on, uh, on the 10th of Muharram, Ashura, uh, are really significant in understanding what does the Imam understand and how he expresses his, his, uh, his engagement with this very narrow opening into historical time, which in reality is a massive gateway. It's a gateway that has been kept open in history and in pre-time for the Imam to go through. We have to, we have to reverse the way that we see things and we have to invert what we think is real. So just consider the following. Uh, the, the first, the first uh, uh, exchange was from a, a, a set of letters were sent to the Imam by the people of Kufa, by the notables of Kufa, not the people of Kufa, uh, who were known to be uh, of the Shia, of Ahlul Bayt salam, some of whom had fought with Imam Ali alayhi salam in both in various battles in Safin and Jamal and so on. And they were known to be the, the stalwarts of the Imami, uh, the Imami party in Kufa. They wrote to him saying, we invite you to come to Kufa as we have no Imam to guide us. And Imam Hussain responds by defining his terms for the Imam. He said in his letter, he, he said in his letter, quote, but you must, you must be clear about the fact that the Imam is only one who follows the book of God, makes justice and honesty his conduct and behavior, judges with truth, and devotes himself to the service of God. These are all these quotes are, are taken from Tabari, Volume Two, of my translation. No mention at all of power. No mention at all of government. No mention at all of authority. But you must be clear about the fact that the Imam is only one who follows the Book of God, 
makes justice and honesty his conduct and behavior, judges with truth, and devotes himself to the service of God. In another letter to the Shia of Basra, Imam Hussain writes, we being the Prophet's family, his close associates endowed with the quality of wilaya or guardianship, his trustees and vice regent or ausia, and his heirs and legatees, the wariths, are the most deserving among all the peoples to take his place. But the people preferred themselves over us for this. We became contented, disliking dissension and anxious to preserve peace and well-being of the community. Though we are fully aware that we are more entitled to this leadership than those who had taken it for themselves. This is again from Mutabari from uh, Abu Mekhnaf. Uh, Maqtal al-Hussein, that's the book by Abu Mekhnaf. So, what the Imam is saying here is that they are the most deserving, but the people preferred others to them. And this preference by the Imam was not denounced. It was taken as a statement. It was taken as a statement of position and fact. One which does not in one, in any shape or form, in one, reduce one iota the Imam of Imam Hussain So worldly power and authority had really nothing to do with the rising of Imam Hussain Neither do I think is the argument that's frequently made that the Imam rose in order to uh, enhance the religious consciousness of the community. This is very much a sort of 1970s uh, talk of Islamist parties. And has nothing, there's no, there's no substance to it in, in terms of any evidence. The evidence that I've described is, shows categorically that the imam could have a physical and temporal dimension, but need not have a physical and temporal dimension. They're, they're two different aspects. So the imam, the imam al -Islam made it clear that worldly power cannot be sought. You cannot go out and seek it but it had to be granted by the community as a matter of free will, their will to the Imam. Once the community grants the Imam the worldly power, which is inferior, I might add, to the form already granted to the Imam in the realm of the unseen, which is the other dimension of the Imam, then the Imam, then the Imam salam, promised in one of his letters that if you listen to me and obey my orders, I will guide you to the right path. He did not say, you will listen to me and I will guide you to the right path. He says, if you listen to me and obey my orders. Again from Tabari. And if the community, for one reason or another, changes its mind about the Imam, which is always possible. I mean, the, the community of Muslims change their mind about Imam Ali alayhi They certainly change their mind about Imam Hassan. Imam Hassan alayhi had an army of 40,000 people. By the time they came from Safin, which is near the Syrian border, back to Kufa, there were about 3,000 left. They all ran away. They all bribed and, and taken over by Muawiyah. So the community, the great community of Muslims, does have the power and the ability and the desire frequently to turn away from what the, the rule of the perfected human being. It is, seems to be standard behavior on their part. And I think the Imam recognizes that once the community has, has given that, 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 uh, that right to the imam to rule over them, it is very, very likely that they would, they would change their mind and the imam will accept that decision. In one of his letters he says, you wrote that we, I think to the people of Kufa here, you wrote that we, the Ahlul Bayt, are more qualified to govern your affairs than those who claim things to which you have no right and who act unjustly and wrongfully. But if you have changed your minds, have become ignorant of our rights and have forgotten your delegations and repeated appeals to me to come for the sake of your religion, I shall turn back. So this hardly seems to be the talk of a revolutionary. It, it is, the, the Imam is trying to describe the station of Imam to people who have 
who have lost or are losing their connection to the unseen, in which the other aspect of imama plays out. It's very, very clear to me, and I think it's really evident that the Imam Hussain was driving for people to understand that the imam is not limited to a form of bay'ah. It has a, a, a function. It is not prophecy, but it has a function in meta-history of guidance and of continuity of guidance that cannot be fixed by power. So the, the, the insan al-kamil, if you want to call the imams, the impeccable imams, the, the, the perfected beings, only see power in terms of authority over others, physical authority over others, in light of the unseen. So they have separated power, that is physical control over people, from authority over people. The authority of the imam is absolutely pervasive. We, all of us here, understand and accept the authority of the imam. But his power over us, worldly power over us, may be limited. Well, it certainly is. The, the way in which the imam extends his, his power over people in the physical realm has terminated. But the authority that he has over those who choose to be in the path of Ahl al-Bayt, is very, very real. So the authority of the Imam over us, over people who claim allegiance to the Ahlul Bayt, is an unqualified right over our affairs, but it need not be accompanied and should not be accompanied by physical control. So the rising of the Imam was in some ways a, an overflow of his combined power of this, from the unseen and seen into the physical realm, but in a highly circumscribed and conditional manner unfolding in this eight weeks between June 15th uh, uh, of the year uh, uh, 60, Hijri, to the, the, the 10th of Muharram, uh, 61. And four issues uh, here are four issues had to be simultaneously resolved for the imam's power to be extended into the physical realm. First of all, the conditions under which physical power is sought have to be established. The duration for which his power is sought has to be established. The manner in which the power is exercised has to be established and the purposes for which power is exercised will also have to be established. So unless you resolve these four issues, unless these four, the conditions re require the willingness of the community, of course the material conditions, the military conditions, but above all the political will of the community to have the imam as a leader, the duration for which power is sought, the imam always mentioned in his discourses and his speeches in these, in these few weeks that he rose in order to affect the, the uh, sulh, the, 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 uh, the wholesomeness uh, of the Muslims. The manner in which power is exercised to, un to undo outer injustice and the purposes for which power, power is exercised is to enhance human beings' connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a single one of these precedent conditions changes, then the imam will not exercise physical authority over the community. But his overall authority does not, does not cease, does not diminish. So when we ask ourselves, how can we give absolute a right to the imam to exercise authority over us, but we don't have, we, we do not allow the imam physical power over us. You have to ask ourselves, what is it that you obey when it comes to dealing with power? And I think there are really three aspects of it, that both, all three aspects uh, have to be in unison before the exercise of power by the imam becomes 
historical reality. One, of course, is force. Power in the state is concentrated power of government or the state is maintained because of force. There's an element of force behind it. So you, you bow to the uh, forces embodied in government and in the state. The other thing is to do with why people acknowledge power is because of legitimacy. It is legitimate for the, this group through these institutions to exercise their power. And the third reason is to do with benefit. You willingly acknowledge or accept that benefits will accrue, whether financial, material, or spiritual benefits will accrue from the exercise of power. In the case of the Imams of Hilbayt, for us, it is to do, above all, it's not nothing to do with force. Nobody has forced us to become imamis or to be followers of the imams. I don't think any of us has sought any substantial material or, or, or uh, temporal uh, benefit from being Shias. And in many ways, it's in fact a, a, great, uh, a great burden. I mean, it doesn't, one does not choose to be a member of, a, say, a persecuted minority in Saudi Arabia uh, just by. Therefore, it must be legitimacy. We are followers of the Ahlul Bayt because they have a legitimate claim of authority over us. And when and if possible, we would like to see and we'd like to support that authority turning into uh, real power. But we can't use force. Force cannot provide legitimacy. And the Imam's promise of ruling with the balance with the scale of Tawheed becomes, in the final analysis, the, the basis of the legitimacy of the authority of the Imam transferred into, uh, into power. And if you look at the only rule, political rule, uh, of an Imam in power is, of course, the rule of Imam Ali, alayhi salam. And at all levels, at all these three levels, force, legitimacy, and benefit, his rule fell apart. His power was not established by force. He did not go and, and, and gain it by, by uh, killing people or defeating enemies or plotting against people. Many questioned his legitimate rule, where I mentioned earlier. I mean, the various battles that he had to go through. His reign was a series of episodes that were, that were uh, fraught with uh, uh, dangers, that were fraught with instability. And I don't think people who supported him, like uh, Ammar ibn Yasser, or Malik ibn Ashtar, or al-Maqdad, these people did not materially benefit from his, from, his, uh, from his rule. Many people left because they could not benefit. Uh, the famous saying in Arabic is that uh, prayer behind uh, Imam Ali is more virtuous, but the food at Muawiyah's table is richer. And many people left him because of that. So, these various issues that I have raised, uh, inshallah, I'll be able to, to uh, discuss them in, in, in the future talks. But in this particular, uh, in, this, in this introductory uh, exposition uh, on, the, on the meaning of Karbala, seen in time and out of time, in the meaning of imama, seen in time and out of time, I think that if I have made people at least aware of the necessity of examining not only the, the ethical and the political and the theological aspects uh, of the Imam's uh, journey, because that's what it is. I, 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 it's a journey that did not end, a journey that continues. If we are able to connect it with the with the vertical axis, with the axis which gives to the imama a station beyond time and beyond the physical limits of space, then I think we will see the the meaning of Karbala uh, in more uh, uh, in more complete uh, uh, form. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, we have time for about five minutes of questions. So if there's any questions.
Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Hanna. Thank you very much indeed for your lecture. Let me just go back to the earlier part of your lecture when we talked about the horizontal axis being the metaphors of Karbala as we understand it, the temporal and the, and the spatial aspects. And why, and your axiom that they're deficient in themselves and don't tell uh, or don't actually classify the importance of imama unless we look at the vertical axis. And I don't think there's anyone in the room who would disagree with that at all. I think we all would actually accept that without any hesitation. But do you think that the metaphors that come into play almost every year at this time have a role? Because what they do is that they attach the emotional aspect to actually considering the whole aspect of Karbala and make perhaps more people think about the vertical axis. So, I, I, you know, um, we won't want to dwell on this as we progress, but just at this early stage, would you say that the horizontal axis actually has an important aspect to it as well? Yes, yes, I, I have no doubt about that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a person who, who in any way or shape or form uh, detracts from the importance of the, of the rituals and the symbols and so on. There are, of course, limits, which I may not subscribe to. But even those limits, frankly, I, I, I don't, as long as they don't hurt others, what people do to themselves is not a matter. So I'm, I'm not against this. But, uh, but to see it purely through that prism, through the prism of political mobilization or social cohesion or making sure that uh, these symbols, which are ultimately rooted in, 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 I mean, in substance, the symbols of Karbala are not the the outer horizontal symbols, let's call them that, are rooted in substance. I'm not denying that, that there was grief. Of course there's grief. I'm not denying that there was a huge element of pathos in the killings that took place. Uh, just the v visualization of the, uh, the, basically the hopelessness of, of, the, of, the, of the cause uh, and the courage with which uh, these impossible obstacles were faced is a hugely edifying story in its own right. But it must not define it only. And what I fear is that it's become its defining features. Uh, the, throughout the 70s and 80s, uh, starting from, I don't know, from Ali Shariati onwards, even anybody who tried to, tried to use the symbols and the, and the rituals of Shiism in order to advance certain causes, uh, we can see what has happened to this, uh, in the sense that it can ignite, it can ignite uh, uh, people's passions. But then, if these passions are channeled and or or used or distorted for other ends, uh, it, it basically detracts from the from from that the significance of that symbol. Everything is 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 it's not either or; it's both and. So. I'm calling for this vertical only to rebalance, as it were, the the emphasis on the on the uh, on the horizontal. And uh, the point really becomes is, is the issue is that if if the rituals and symbols become the sole defining features, then I think uh, we have lost, in many ways, lost the plot. <laughs> Are there any questions from the sister side? Thank you. So one. I just want to have uh, some clarifications. Uh, would Imam, I mean, including Imam Hussain alayhi uh, salam, would were they always trying to gain temporal power or not, uh, or were they just saying, okay, um, we'll continue with what we are doing, but if people want us to be the Khalifa in the temporal sense, then we'll accept to, uh, to rule physically uh, over people? Or do they uh, try and uh, do uh, some kind of underground work to try and achieve that uh, control? And how would you <coughs> find, for example, that he, uh, Imam Hussain, refused to do the bayah of Yazid, for instance? You know, just accept his khilafa and continue with what he would want to do? Well, I mean, the bayah of Yazid was, is, is really unacceptable in many ways. I mean, Muawiyah was 
was a far more astute figure than his son. And no matter what one says about Muawiyah, the outer forms of Islam were, were maintained in his rule. And as long as the, the, the conduct of the court in public uh, was, not, was not detrimental to the outer uh, observances, then I don't think uh, any imam could, uh, and I mean, after, especially after Imam Hassan's uh, truce, uh, there, was, there was no basis for it. But Yazid was a, was a uh, fasiq in every sense of the word. And paying allegiance to it, even though, uh, I mean, that's how I understand it, but uh, I cannot really see uh, the possibility of an impeccable imam giving a bay'ah to Yazid, uh, given the nature of that, of that, uh, uh, of that character. Uh, I think it would have been one step too far. Now, the imams in, in, in later on did give allegiance or did not at least resist the power and authority of the Abbasi Khilafahs and so on. Uh, but none of them, I think, reached the level of uh, practically apostasy of Yazid, at least in their public, uh, public manifestations. So I think it is... It is to do with authority and the difference between authority and power. I think the imams were content and to see their imama exercised through authority over those who willingly acknowledge that authority rather than uh, seek power for the sake of imposing their authority over others. The, the other aspect I think I've, which I think is consistent throughout all the imams is that Power is not something that is sought. It is something that is given. Uh, of course, this runs counter to you know, modern politics, but that is the reality of the imam. The imam does not seek power. Power seeks him. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the actual, uh, without necessarily diminishing or detracting, from their insistence on their rightness to power. I wanted to clarify in a sense, but they still try to, uh, uh, in many senses, to say, look, we are the legitimate, actually, uh, successors, uh, khalifas. Uh, uh, so therefore, we have a right over you, whoever was the khalifa. So in a way, they were trying to uh, exercise, uh, to be wanting to uh, be a temporal rulers. I can't see how you say that because, I mean, the imam when he left Mecca had made no preparation whatsoever to seek power. The main concentrations of the Shia, apart from the, you know, southern Iraq, were in Yemen and also in you know, Arab garrisons in Iran. There was no attempt to contact them. There was no attempt to create a kind of, you know, the plot of Abu Muslim Khalasani when they overthrew the Umayyads. It had nothing to do with that. I think um, my reading of the imams and power is, is confirms that, that there is a sharp division between authority and power. And the imams exercise their authority over those who willingly acknowledge it. And the imams have an overarching authority over those, even those who don't acknowledge it, but not in the physical realm. So, I mean, I think that is why we, we, uh, we maintain our allegiance to the, to the imams of Ahlul Bayt and the Ghaybah. It is the issue of authority, not of power. Now, of course, the theology of, of, of the Shia has evolved to the point where uh, power is connected to the deputies and of the imam and so on. And, and there's an entire political philosophy built around that. But this is not an imami philosophy. This is a post-imami or a neo-imami philosophy. Uh, thank you very much. I think due to so shortage of time, we'll end there. Uh, salwar.